Good morning. Welcome to another webinar hosted by Chrissy Scare with our special with our guest speaker presenter, Mr. Dr. Charleston Brathwaite. Thank you for joining us. Today our session is on how to speak in public. We all have that meeting, parent-teacher meeting, a Bible reading in church, or a memo to read at a staff meeting. And for some people, you, your tummy starts to give you butterflies, you start to get weak in your knees, and you just have this genuine fear of how to speak in public. How do you relate to people in a crowd? You just don't know what to do. Then there are also some persons who are super confident, would stand up and speak their mind and not be afraid of who is there or and, and just say what they want. But are you communicating effectively? So today we are going to touch on how to be a good speaker in public because we want to work on being an effective communicator, how to get over those butterflies and just be able to speak and bring your point across to persons. So I'm now going to turn you over to Dr. Chelston so that he can give you more insights on this topic. Good morning, Christine. Good morning. And good morning to all our listeners. Welcome to another of our personal development sessions. Today, the topic is about public speaking. And it relates a lot to two things that we have touched on before. The first one was on self-esteem. And the other one was overcoming the fears of life in order to be successful. And both are related to public speaking. In a real sense, the ability to speak in public is something that all of us would like to be able to do. It normally brings uh, admiration and respect and a sense of personal satisfaction that you can get up and express your ideas in public. And it is something that is a goal in life that we all seek. But how do you achieve that goal? How do you become an effective public speaker? How do you transmit your ideas without fear? What is it that you must do in order to achieve this grand goal of being able to communicate well in public? Today, we're going to touch on this topic I'm not an expert in this area, but I'll give you the benefit of my experience. Uh, what I have been able to do in order to be able today to be able to communicate in the public space. Let me begin with a dialogue that I had with a friend of mine who I said, I have to give a seminar on public speaking. And he said to me, when I'm called upon to speak in public, I become nervous, self-conscious, and frightened. I can't think clearly. I cannot concentrate. And I can't remember what I intended to say. This is the experience of many people. And then the same person I was talking to went on to say the following. I wish to appear confident. I wish to speak with poise and with grace. I wish to be able to think on my feet. I want to get my thoughts together in a logical manner. And I want to say what I have to say clearly in a way to convince people about my ideas. The fears and hopes expressed in this conversation are very common. In fact, I have encountered many others in my experience. I've heard of persons who cried when they were asked to speak in public. I've heard of persons who fainted when they were asked to speak in public. 
persons who began to sweat profusely, people whose heart began to beat rapidly, people who needed to go to the bathroom, persons whose minds became blank, persons who said, I had butterflies in my stomach, Persons who would rather go to war than to speak in public, such is the nature of the fears. And all these reactions are reactions of fear. In order to become a successful public speaker, even in a PTA meeting, in a birthday celebration, in a class celebration, or in any public space, you need to manage your fears. Now, no, I did not say eliminate your fears. You cannot really eliminate your fears. All persons have a fear of speaking in public, but you manage your fears because everyone has that ability to manage. Most coaches who help people in public speaking recognize there are four basic steps to becoming a good speaker. But what are the four basic steps? The first step, you have to start with a strong desire to be a successful public speaker. You have to have the will, you have to have the goal, you have to have it in you that this is what you want to do. I wish to be a good public speaker. Once that is embedded in your mental makeup, you begin to take appropriate steps to achieve that goal. The second thing you need to do is you need to know what you're going to talk about. Some people get up to speak and they weren't quite sure what they're going to say. Well, you can't get up to speak until you know exactly what you're going to say. You must be clear on what it is you wish to achieve and what it is you wish to communicate. What do I really want to communicate to my audience? The third thing you need to do, you must act with confidence. Act in a way that you know what you are doing. Act in a way that you are the person who's in charge of what you're going to say. Act in a way which suggests that you are the person who's the expert on this particular topic because you have thought about it, you've done your homework. And the fourth step is practice practice, practice. Mm -hmm. There is no way that that could be eliminated from the agenda. You have to practice. You do not become perfect by giving one speech or talking at one PTA meeting. It comes from practicing. And you can practice with anyone. Could be your friend, could be your husband, could be your wife, could be your children. But practice, 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 because practice makes perfect. So let's talk about the desire to be a successful speaker, which is key to overcoming those fears. The first thing you have to do of think of what speaking well in public will do for you. If you can speak well in public, it brings respect and admiration it will increase your personal influence on other people. You will be seen as a leader among your peers. Then there's a possibility of promotion in your job, increased salary, and the making of new friends. It will give you a sense of strength, a feeling of power, a sense of pride and accomplishment. It is this enthusiasm that helps you to overcome the fears because you tell yourself, I can do it. Tell yourself, I can. I'm going to be a self-confident speaker who speaks with poise and grace and who's able to think on my feet, to get my thoughts together in a logical manner and say what I have to say clearly and a way to convince people about my ideas. Well, that's the contract that you have with yourself. 
you make that silence contract, that quiet contract, without telling anybody what you plan to do, you just say to yourself on a daily basis, I am going to be a self-confident speaker. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make this my goal. I want to be a self-confident speaker who speaks with poise and grace and who's able to think on my feet, get my thoughts together in a logical manner, and that is part of your goal. This contract with yourself is key. Then you begin the implementation. Know what you want to talk about. One famous speaker said, don't speak until you're sure that you have something to say. If you don't have anything to say, shut up, keep quiet, listen to others. But if you have something to say, formulate in your mind what it is you have to say and get up boldly and say it. Because all of us have the right to express our views and our opinions, and we have a right to be able to do that without fear or favor. So develop that self-confidence. That is key to overcoming the fears. The self-confidence that says, I can do it, what? And secondly, I want to be a self-confident speaker and I'm going to work on that. That's one of my goals in life. Having decided that you want to be a self-confident speaker, as I said, you have to know what it is you have to say. That means you must think before you speak. In that way, you must ask yourself two questions. What do I really wish to say? Who is my audience? What is the best way to express what I have to say to my audience? Now, it is key that you understand the nature of to whom you are speaking. What is the level of communication that you should be considering to this group. Clearly, if you're talking to a group of five-year-olds, it's different from talking to a group of 15-year-olds, or a group of 30-year-olds, or a group of 50-year-olds, or a group of old people. If you're talking to a group of old people, you're talking to a group of people who have vast experience, they have lived a life. If you're talking to people who are five and six years old, they have not yet lived. And therefore, your, your, your point of reference will be different talking to a group of old people as opposed to a group of children. And as you speak to children, you have to speak in their language. You have to speak at a level that they will understand. That is why stories are so important in public speaking and stories are so important in communication because when you communicate a story, you communicate a story with a meaning at the level of the audience that you have. And communicating a story is one of the best ways to improve your public speaking. A story of a, a visit you have made. I went to the zoo and I saw this amazing animal that I never saw before. And it was eating and feeding its young, like how a mother feeds her children. And I was able to see the reaction that they gave. You could see love being expressed by the animal for the young children or her, her, her children. And they were taking it directly from her and giving it to the others and sharing. And what you do is communicate an experience of love, an experience of caring, an experience of sharing. And using these stories to express what you have seen or what you have lived or what you have acknowledged, what you have experienced is key because you are in fact communicating a personal story, a personal story that is unique to you and the way you have interpreted what you have seen. So one way of improving your public speaking is to become a storyteller. Tell little stories to your brother, to your sister, to your mom, to your dad, stories of what you have experienced. And in expressing those stories, you begin to develop confidence. You begin to develop methods of communication. 
you develop the, the, the wherewithal that arms you with a certain level of confidence to communicate with a bigger audience. So you start off by communicating with your sister, with your mother, with your friend, and you tell the stories. So storytelling is a good place to start in trying to become a good speaker. But if you're not familiar with the topic that you're going to talk about, it is very important to do some research. Don't decide that you are going to talk on a topic without doing some research on it because you stand up and suddenly you find, well, you know, I really don't know this topic. I haven't studied it. Do your research and take notes. When you do your research, just take notes of what you have found. What experiences you found? What other people have thought about this subject? What experience we have gathered in history about the topic? Are you going to be talking about child care? If you're going to give a speech on child care, what's the prevailing knowledge about child care? What's the prevailing approaches to child care? How do people in different cultures approach child care? What has been the most successful examples of good child care? How would I, as a parent, manage my own child? And what communication methods would I use to convince my child that I love, that I care, and that I'm looking at after their best interests? And in doing the research, you begin to develop your own concept not only what other people have thought about or what other people have done, but you develop your own concept. What do you think about child care? If you had a child to care for, how would you care for it? And what would you communicate and how would you communicate with that child? So just imagine that you had to give an address on child care. Imagine yourself sitting down and saying, okay, tomorrow I have to give a half hour speech on child care. Where am I going to start? What do I think about child care? What have other people done? And we have a very powerful tool today. We have the internet. The internet is a vast and important instrument of knowledge. You can go onto Google and you just put in child care and Google will bring up references to a lot of information on child care. You may even see speeches on child care, which you can look at and determine whether this is what you want to say. And one of the key things, the third key, which I mentioned, is you have to act with confidence. You can't get up and like you're not quite sure what you want to say. You have to get up and be positive. When you're invited to speak, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Walk confidently. If there's a podium, walk confidently to the podium as if you were a world expert in the topic. Nobody knows more about this than you. So you have your chest up, you have your eyes focused on your audience, and you're going out there as if you know more about this topic than everybody else in the room. Confidence. And as you portray that confidence, the audience will be expecting you to deliver. Look the audience in the eye. Smile and greet them. Give a greeting. Don't just go into the topic. You have to greet your audience. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here. I'm pleased to have been invited to speak to you this evening on the topic of child care. And you start saying what you hope to do in your speech. In this speech this evening, I wish to discuss the history of child care. I wish to talk to you about child care in the Barbadian society. I wish to tell you about the challenges of childcare in the context of COVID, what parents went through in terms of childcare during COVID. I wish to mention the whole political reality, what, what efforts the government is taking to address childcare and how do I see it in terms of whether these efforts will be successful or not. And what is the history of childcare in my country? So you, you, you act as if you have done your homework. You act with confidence. Don't go out there, you don't know anything about the topic that they ask you to talk about. You go out there because you have done your research. You understand. Look the audience straight in the eye, smile and greet them. Acknowledge the invitation. 
who has invited you to this session? Acknowledge the invitation, say to Mr. So-and-so who invited me here. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you. Exude that you are pleased to be there, that you're happy to be there. You can't go there frightened as if you're not happy to be there. So you have to exude pleasure and confidence. You are now in charge. And as far as you're concerned, nobody in the audience know more about this topic than you because you have done your work. You are the boss. You exude leadership. Remember that in war, the best defense is offense. So you're almost in a war situation. You are aggressive. And aggressive doesn't mean that you are attacking everybody, but you have a positive mental attitude. You have a positive approach. I know what I'm talking about. I have studied this thing. I have experience in this, and I want to tell you my ideas of it. So that positive overcomes the fears because you now feel, I know this thing and I can do it. And of course, you would have got there because you have practice, practice, practice. If necessary, write out your speech. Sit down and read it through. And remember, the last and only way to be a great speaker is to practice. Take advantage of opportunities to speak in parties, in meeting, join Toastmasters. This is a good place to start. Get feedback from your friends as to how you could improve your next speech on the basis of what you did in the last speech. And somebody says, well, you know, that point you made at the end should have been at the beginning. Or you did not give a summary that summarized what you have done. You cannot learn to swim by standing on the beach. You have to get into the water. You have to get into the water in order to swim. And this is where public speaking is no different. You, in order to be a good public speaker, you have to speak. You can't sit down quietly in a corner and listen and believe you're going to become a great public speaker. It ain't going to happen. You have to get up and speak. Get up and speak with the understanding that you're not going to be perfect the first time. You are willing and open to feedback and you're willing to keep trying. So let me read something for you when I was preparing this that I ran into in a book called Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie. I will hold it up. You may be able to see it. It is a very interesting book for those of you who are interested in learning public speaking. It's called Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie. On page 96, he says the following. I'll read this for you because it's very interesting. He said, all fools, all fools are alike. But he said, no two men are just alike. Every new life is a new thing under the sun. There has never been anything just like it before and never, never will be again. A young man ought to get that idea about himself. He should look for the single spark of individuality and make, that makes him different from other folks and develop that for all that it is worth. Society and schools may try to iron out that out of him. Their tendency is to put us all in the same box. But I say, don't let the spark be lost. It's your only real claim to importance. All that is doubly true of public speaking. There is no other human being in the world just like you. Hundreds of millions of people have two eyes and a nose and a mouth but none of them look precisely like you. And none of them have exactly your traits and methods and cast of mind. Few of them will talk and express themselves just like you, just like you do when you're speaking naturally. In other words, you have an individuality. And we said that from the beginning when we spoke about self-esteem. And as a speaker, it is your most important possession. Cling to it cherish it, develop it. It is the spark that will put force and sincerity into your speaking. It is your only real claim to importance. So your individuality, your characteristics, those things that make you you will come over in your public speaking. And last of all, prepare your speech. So you've been invited to speak at the event, how you begin. 
you must first answer some questions. Who invited you to this event? Who will be your audience? What will you be trying to communicate? And what are the expectations of the event? Having answered these questions, you can go about preparing your speech. Your speech must have three parts very clearly. An opening statement, a middle a body of facts, and a conclusion. The conclusion is very important because the conclusion says what I would like you to lead with. What are the takeaways that I would like you to have? The beginning statement tells the audience what you're going to talk about. The conclusion says what I would like you to take away as a result of my intervention and my speech. You must study the speeches of great speakers and use them as guides. There's nothing wrong with looking and seeing what other people have done. As I said, there's nothing new under the sun. If you're going to give a, a speech on, on uh, caring for young children, there's nothing wrong in seeing what other people have said before and understanding where they came from. Of course, you're going to put your own spin on it and your own experience on it, but there's nothing wrong in seeing what other people have done. So you can become a great speaker. Once you have the will and the determination to do it, once you do your homework, once you act with confidence, and once you practice, practice, practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chelston Brathwaite. That was very informative. And just to reinforce some of the points that you would have made, you spoke about walking to the podium and your confidence. And what came to mind for me was, look at our prime minister. When our prime minister is going to speak, persons in the crowd could be talking, chit-chatting, doing, but when you hear her name being announced and she starts to walk to the podium, everybody just stops. She demands and her authority. And then when she begins to speak, you, if, like we went through the whole pandemic where it was a lot of uncertainty and I'm sure she would have been scared. She, I'm sure she had a lot of points where she did not even know what to tell the public and we were asking for her to give us updates and stuff. But because of the way she spoke with confidence, even when she's scolding us as a society for not following the protocols and mandates, she presented with confidence. She spoke clearly. She took her time, she explained, and that is like a classic example. Now take for example, I remember watching when our Minister of Education first started to speak. And now looking back, I am so, so proud of Ms. Bradshaw. At first when she spoke, you could see that she was nervous and it was new for her. But you know what she did? She practiced and she practiced. And now when you see her speak, you no longer see this timid, shy person coming on and giving you information. She's now demanding and stamping her authority to the point now that when you are uncertain or people tend to realize that you are not sure, you're, you're, you, you lack that confidence, then they question you. But when you come with that authority, not that they wouldn't question you, but they tend to believe you a bit more because now you are speaking as though you are sure. And this is one of the major things we have to take away. You spoke about storytelling. And when I tell people that I was very shy and I wanted to start a childcare business, I wanted to get investors and people to support not only for my business, Christie's Care, but for the special needs community in Barbados. But how am I supposed to do this if I cannot speak? If I cannot explain my vision of what I would like to do with the children in my care. How am I going to expect persons to come and donate to me, whether it's goods or finances? So I joined Toastmasters. And Toastmasters is a very good thing that persons can, a group that you can join. And they teach you public speaking. They teach you about the verbal and nonverbal cues because sometimes we come and we speaking and we like, yo, and our attitude, our demeanor, or sometimes we stand behind the podium and the podium is blocking half of our face. 
we need to know these things in terms of when we are speaking because it's not just to speak but to be an ex effective communicator so that we get our point across at this time i would like to answer if there's any questions i know you have persons both on facebook live and persons in the zoom room If there is no questions, then I just wanted to turn this conversation. The, the topic for today is how to speak in public. Now we have our children, because I'm, I'm in childcare, so we're gonna have to always bring it back to children. We have children and our children come home and I grew up where my mom and my dad would ask me every day, how was school? And in doing that, I was learning how to express myself. We have a lot of people, children and adults in society who are unable to express themselves. Tell me how you feel. Tell me what is wrong. Tell me what happened. They're not able to do that. And that's something we need to work on because if we and ourselves cannot express ourselves in terms of how we feel, then imagine you, you come in to talk on a topic that you are not familiar with. That's why practice comes in. That's why we have to do our research. But in doing that, we still have to know the words and how to bring it about to be able to communicate effectively. So back to the children, encourage them to speak, explain. They might not get it right. The sentences might be wrong. They might be confused, but you guide them. Guide them so that this is a learning process. This is actually practical learning. What happened at school today? Oh, this body hit me. And, and what did you do? I tell the teacher. And what did the teacher say? And then, so, and then after that, you can then give me a summary. So what did you learn from this whole experience? Are you going to just hit them back? Or are you going to tell the teacher? Because look, when you hit them back, both of you got in trouble. These are things we can do to help our children communicate and express themselves. And when we can do this from young, then we're going to have all the children. Then they have a saying in Barbados, children are to be seen and not heard. Let the children express themselves. Sometimes it's not what it is say, how did we, the attitude and, but you can guide them, guide them from young so that they get it right when they're older. Any questions? Anything to add, Chelston? For sure. I would, just like, to, I would just like to add that the ability to express yourself is a very important aspect of your personality. Because if you are quiet and um, never say anything in meetings, people think you're dumb. People have a very low opinion of you. They said, but she comes to meeting, I've never heard her say anything. I've never heard her made a contribution to the discussion. She doesn't comment on the comments of others and the contribution others make. And in many cases, we have seen situations where people do have ideas, where people do have thought, but they cannot express it. They have not developed that capacity to say what they're thinking. And Christine, you have made a very important point about children must be seen and not heard. That is one of the negative aspects of parenting that should be eliminated completely. Children should be heard. If you don't hear them, how do you know what they're going through? How do you know what their problems are? How do you know what they're thinking? How do you know where they, what their goals are? Mm -hmm. And parenting has to do with that communication in order to give guidance. And you can only give guidance if you know what's going through the child's head. And so it is critically important that children must be heard, even if they're not seen. So we will switch this around a bit and let us hear our children, let us hear them express themselves and let us understand the challenges that they will have as they grow older. Because if we don't understand those challenges, then we cannot be good parents. Otherwise, the child will bottle up inside all the tensions and all the stresses, and then that leads to all kinds of mental 
problems, depression, etc., then you have to go and see the psychologist or you have to go and see the psychiatrist because the child has not been able to express what's going on inside. If the child was able to express and communicate, a lot of the problems could be solved before you get to going to see the psychologist and the psychiatrist about the problem that the child may be having. So but communication even, is key. Even with this, one of the other things that happen is abuse. Because now you build this thing in the child's head that they cannot say or they cannot do this, then they hide everything and you don't even know somebody's, somebody's abusing your child. You don't know what's going on at school. Your child is being bullied. In this whole COVID time, we are a lot of people, um, were co some children and keep committing suicide. And people were like, but how this happened and how this body, but they may say nothing, but sometimes we won. In order for you, yes, it's good to communicate, but you have to have somebody to listen to. Everybody can't be talking. Somebody has to listen. And I realize in our society, we have a lot of people who are, I don't even know what to say, not bad seat drivers, but like they would not come up front and say, but they have an opinion on everything. If there's a press conference or FB online, they're not going to open their mic and say what they want to say or express themselves, but they're going to critique everything in writing, whether on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, but they're not going to. And then it's okay to cut down every idea that somebody has, but what solution are you offering? It's okay. Oh, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. That's a bad decision. That was, but then what would you suggest? It's okay for you to have your opinion, but do you, what do you bring to the table? So it's not only about you having the idea or you criticizing, but you also have to bring, express yourself as well to say what you, your, give your, your two things. I would like to say also that a significant amount of, or the capacity to speak and to express your ideas, a lot comes from reading. And mm. in our society, a lot of people do not read. Yeah. They don't read a newspaper. They don't read a book. They listen to the radio. They listen to brass stacks, uh, or they may just listen to music. But in our society, we do not have a culture of reading. When I was growing up, I remember we had to have membership in the library. Mm -hmm. And every week you went to the library to renew books, to take yeah. back the old ones and take out a new set of books. And parents encourage the children to read. Nowadays, the children are all stuck on the iPhone or the tablet. And they're on social media sending pictures of what they ate yesterday and what they wore last night. But, okay. but they don't have time to read. They don't have time to, to, to understand what's going on in the world and what other people are thinking and what other cultures are thinking and what new ideas are evolving because they don't read. Okay, so I, I have, have two points for that. I have two points. Of reading. We have to promote a culture of reading as a basis also for public speaking and expressing your ideas. Okay, to be fair, Charles, Dr. Charleston, one, the iPads and the tablets do have ebooks. It's just that persons choose not to use them. So that is my point on that. Yes, you can have technology, but you have to use it effectively. And then the second thing that I believe we are like, so we are not even, we don't even know the numbers. There are a number of people in the Barbadian society who do not know how to read. There are a lot of people who are what we call street smart. They can catch a bus and get from home to town. So, but ask them to sign a document. Ask them to fill out the, a form in a government institution for something. They do not know how to read. And I remember growing up, as, as you said, the bus used to come, to, the library bus used to come to the school and you get your library books and you're all fussy. And then they had these little Saturday morning reading sessions at the library. But in reality, half of the libraries are closed. I remember during the summer, the library used to have some little summer camps and you would come down to the library and my mom taking me and you spend the day there and you do craft and different things. But with, ch with change and technological advancements, you have to realize that some of these things we have now taken away and disadvantaged our, ch our children with. But how do we incorporate them? Because it's okay to have this, 
But if you're going to have the children come to the library and you're going to have it boring, I really would not want to go either. So we need to now see how we can marginalize some of the things that we would have done when we were in school. I like the idea of, yes, you come to the library, reread a book on, say, for example, a particular craft, and then you have the hands-on because a lot of people are more hands-on than academic in reality. And we have that hands-on experience that you can now make what you read into a practical sense, I think that's where we need to move in society, even in our teaching styles. Gone are the days where teachers come on a, a blackboard or whiteboard and just write notes. Yes, it gives dictation or so, but no, we have to use a lot of PowerPoints and media and video to capture these children and these persons' attention. So if we want to get the library and the reading, we now have to see how can we make it a fun and interactive thing to, to capture the youth. That's, that's the reality of it. How, it, how? Will be, it will be fun and interactive if we know what are the interests of the children. And yes. therefore we can orient them toward things that are of their interest. Every yes. child has an interest in something. And what we have to do is detect that interest. Of course, as the little speech that I said, they try to put us all into one box, but we're not all the same. And the, the educational system must be sufficiently flexible and dynamic that it can identify the strengths and weaknesses of each child. And the teacher has, and the parents have to be able to channel the child towards the things that they show an interest in. Because at the end of the day, that is what's going to capture the imagination. That is what's going to give them some excitement in their lives. The children who are interested in art, mm -hmm. but they're not interested in law. They're not interested in medicine. They're not interested in becoming an astronaut. They want to do art. Mm -hmm. We have to capture that early and channel the child's interest in that direction, find books of art, find information on art and help the child to develop develop that skill and that capacity. The educational system has to be for lifelong learning and it has to be for life, life skills. Mm -hmm. And until the educational system begin to change to develop these life skills, the classroom will be boring and the children will not be excited, not even about going to school. The, so the, there's much the, to be done. The other thing as well is that Parents always complain and say that like, you buy this child this fancy toy and the child goes and plays with the box. Or you realize your two-year-old enjoys playing with the broom, like of all things, the broom. But then I come to the reality of children are interested in things that they see us or the adults using. So we are their examples. We are their first role models. So you want the child to read and, oh, you must sit down and read the book every evening after school and before you're going to bed. But then are you as a parent doing it? You're not reading. The child is not seeing you doing this, but yet you're expecting the child to do all these things. Children mimic adults. You will realize that a child will take up a broom or a mop and try to sweep the house. The child will try to um, take up the iron to press because they're, those are things that they are seeing the parents do. The children go in and, well, back in my day, we used to make mud pies because you're mimicking what you see your parents doing, making, using the stove and cooking. You're trying to do that. But we want the children to read, but the parents aren't reading. You want the children to do this, but the, the children are not seeing this being done. So then how are you going to expect to motivate them if you're not seeing it, if they're not seeing it done as well? I love the point with finding their interests and I like the arts. Back in the day, persons did not value the arts, where the, whether it's dance, singing, graphic design, those are, they didn't think about those things. Oh, those are your hobbies. But now people are now seeing how you can make money from it. Like, yes. I think Rihanna was the biggest eye opener in Barbados. Like, we had people singing and we had Kimberly Ennis and all these people who would have gone overseas and tried. We have little athletes that would have gone to Olympics. And, but then mm -hmm. what happens to them? What happens to them? Because the dwindle, so then we don't have a society who's motivated to get into these things because we're saying, oh, that's just a phase. That's just two weeks after. Well, he, he, you don't hear anything. But then we have somebody out there who is saying, you can do it. You can become a singer if you want. We have a lot of people with talent in Barbados, but they're not, we don't have 
have the infrastructure to support you don't have the, and the and support to, to, system to develop these things when mm -hmm. overseas now children learning to do music from the time they're two and three and learn to swim from the time they're six months we here at the sea ain't got in the back door you ain't going in the water you get drunk and then you got <laughs> persons like michael phelps who, who who can who can do it don't even start me with special needs because i uh, you know that's my passion we of are course. not having things put in place for these children. And then we expect them to reach 18 and 21 and have it all figured out when we don't even know ourselves and we don't have things in place to teach and guide these people. So before we can even get to that, start with parents being the example. You want your children to read? Read, even read with the child. I would do, I read a page, you read a page. Or I read a page and you do read two pages or, and you go like that. And if it's a word you don't know, use technology okay let's google it let's ask alexa we can do those things and uh, we have a question you can go ahead and ask your question we were just having a moment here <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a question i'm just i'm just like to input to um you know what is being said um good morning to everyone my name is carlita and and we have having a very good and powerful conversation this morning. But just to add to what is being said. That's my mom. <laughs> What's your mom? Okay. Yes. Um, I just want to make like three main points here that I was just making a note of. And, and it, they might have been mentioned in a different way um, by other speakers. But one of the things I like about when we said we, um, we have to allow children to express themselves is that it, it, it builds a relationship because as, as doctor said before, we get to see where, what the children are thinking about. And while, you, while we were talking, I was smiling because Christine was one of those children who every time you tell her something, she wants to know, but why? But why? Sometimes I say, Christine is just, this is what it is and that's just it. Don't ask no. <laughs> so what happened is that because she's asking why all the time, she was basically challenging me. So in challenging me now, I have to come up with answers. I have to come up with solutions. So now it's making me think on this hand so that I could have the information ready for her if she's gonna ask me, why can't I wait as Jess? I gotta be ready to say why and the reason gotta be where I'm comfortable with the amount of information I'm giving her or why not? And so I, as parents, that's one thing I want to encourage you. Let the question be an opportunity for you to teach, for you to get to know your child, okay? Because look today, because of the asking why and presenting um, an opportunity for her to express herself, it helped her to build confidence as, as she mentioned before, she was shy. And here, she, here, here we are today, Christine hosting something because of those whys and the opportunity that was presented to her earlier. Now she have the confidence to talk. And, and so um, in our society, sometimes children are, um, these days are being bullied because they don't speak up. They don't speak up because they are afraid because our society suppress them. You don't speak to your elders, it's rude to do this. No, it's not rude if it is present it in the right way. If, if the children know how to ask questions without being rude, yeah. then that is okay. Yeah. So um, speaking in public, for me, the foundation start by speaking at home. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's just my input in it. Thank you. Excellent, Thank you. excellent you. contribution. And I like the last point you made. That speaking in public begins by speaking at home. This is very, very important. The ability to communicate at home, the ability to express your ideas at home is the foundation for developing that confidence. Because all speaking in public is about is confidence. Confidence is the key word to speaking in public. When you, because the time that you step to that podium, the speakers, the audience, can detect your level of confidence. And even before you open your mouth, just the way you approach the podium, the audience detects whether you are confident 
in doing what you're doing. And that confidence is part of the communication skill that is critical for you to communicate ideas, to get people to understand where you're coming from and to, to seek to, to change, bring about change where change is necessary. Um, earlier, Christine mentioned the case of the Prime Minister of Barbados. The Prime Minister of Barbados is one of the most effective communicators that I know. Because not only is she communicating, she is bringing about change by what she says. And she's a transformational leader and a transformational leader who uses communication very effectively to communicate with the entire society. One minute she speaks very good English, a minute she speaks good Bajan, but she's communicating, <laughs> she's communicating with all levels of the society to get them to understand where she's coming from. And I think during the COVID pandemic, her communications were a major contributor to the success that we had in dealing with the COVID pandemic, because what she did was communicated a level of confidence and, and uh, um, support to the society. We as a government, we're doing the best to help you. Yes, this is a challenging situation, but we will overcome it. Yeah, th those kinds of communication methods and uh, strategies are critical when you are a leader and when you're in charge of a nation, uh, a class, a, a group, a society, or whatever it is, those, those nuggets of communicating confidence is very, very, very important for the benefit of your audience. So Before the fact that it begins at home is very, very important. Yeah, We've, I wanted to, I'm uh, just jumping here. You ever had an experience where you are listening to somebody talk and they're talking so much like nonsense or rubbish and they're doing it with confidence that sometimes you cannot believe it that some you know better but because the way they bring it about or the way they speak it make you feel like oh I should actually like you make you start to feel like if you should you're doubting yourself because they just have the confidence you ever yes. experienced I don't know if anybody yes. watching experienced that as well well Check that occurs a lot confidence is that occurs a lot in the church. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, but yes. Preachers are able to convince you to their way of thinking. Okay. Whereas preachers that are not convincing, you begin to say, well, I'm not mm, so sure about this. This yeah. phrase doesn't sound right. <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's true. So the oh. communicator is very important. And that level of confidence is key to what you're going to believe after the sermon. It's true. Not only that too, but one of the good, one of the powerful factor about communicating has to do with your body language. So, yes. for example, if you can have the most powerful of um speeches, well written, whatever, and you cannot deliver, and your body language doesn't match, it doesn't mimic what you're saying, then people are looking at you and they they don't feel it because the two doesn't blend. You know what I'm saying? Some people yeah. may say a simple thing, but that's one of the things the Prime Minister of Barbados have that Christine mentioned. She's powerful with her delivery, her body language, her tone, mm -hmm. all are pale apart in her delivery. So also while we are talking about this, you, you, there are some people that can be very shy, but when they're delivering a message, their body language, you know, show that confidence you know, and how they deliver that message. So that's a vital part to your body language has to be a part of your delivery. A very important point. And I think in addition to the body language, it is whether you have experienced what you're talking about. Yes. Where you present a case that you have lived the situation, then people really begin to believe you. They begin to understand. I had an audience once and uh, I was talking about money management and the challenges that we have in terms of how 
we accumulate wealth and what we do with what we earn and so on. And I was able to give them the case of the fact that when I grew up as a child, my mother used to give me 50 cents a week to manage. Of course, 50 cent in those days was a lot more than 50 cents today. <laughs> but the point is I was given 50 cents a week to manage. So I had to manage this 50 cents so that by Friday, I still had money to pay the bus to get home. So Monday, you were given the 50 cent. The bus fare was three cents to get home. And if you took the money or you bought lunch or an expensive lunch, you walk home. So you had the choice between taking the bus or going out there and buying a turnover or buying a sweet drink, as the case may be. So you made early choices. The point was that I was able to convince my audience about money management because I told them that as a child, I had to manage 50 cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, is a, this is an excellent point, Charleston. Like, I remember, <laughs> my mom would tell you that I sell everything, <laughs> but I, we, we, don't, we, we don't understand the importance of giving the child that little $2 to buy a snack, you know, because I remember a fear coming up as a child. And yes, your parents might give you, but you might want a little extra because sometimes after the fair, you want to go to Shafet or so. And you get your lunch money and, or you want to buy something. You would decide, okay, instead of buying chips and chicken today, I can just buy chips and I can save that chicken money. And by the end of the week, or you want to buy something, your parents can't tell you no because I already saved my money. Mm -hmm. or you used to get this thing oh my gosh I can't remember what you call it but you like you do little chores around the house and you get right. like a little um I can't, allowance allowance, allowance. You, get an yes. allowance. you get an allowance yes. and then you have the importance of a piggy bank and I remember waiting for Christmas to open this piggy bank guess what so that I can buy my friend's gift and it's it's, it's teaching you self-worth too because when I knew that I could buy something for myself with my own money, it felt so much better than when my parents or a family member gave me. And guess what? You actually take care of it a lot more the way somebody course, else gave you. Because course, you course. know what it is to work for these things. You know what it is to sacrifice to get these things. Some children are so privileged. Like you have an iPad today, drop it tomorrow. The person, the parent, buy you back another one. When you have to work with that screen and it ain't leaking out, <laughs> And it's frustrating you. And then you have to be putting little money there until you can buy, uh, save enough money to get a new tablet or a new screen. Guess what? You, you're not going to be careless with that anymore because you know what it's like not to have it because you love it. So you also have to teach that and teach the consequences. Another point you, you both, you and my mom talked about, touched was the importance of nonverbal cues. I could come here and say, I am very passionate about children and like I just love children and everything I do about children is like I just really want us to be best for this generation and it's like oh, I'm just really what, what, would you believe that or would you believe me saying I always had a love and a passion for children from time I all knew myself and the way I was brought up reinforced this so that I can be the advocate for the special needs community what would you believe the, your attitude, your verbal, your facial expression, all of these things play a part in you being able to speak in public and convince the persons that you're speaking to, they can feel your passion, they can feel your, if you're genuine or are you just coming out here and speaking because you just want to be an influencer on Facebook. Exactly. Exactly. Very important. And then the important thing, again, is what are you speaking about? I can come here and host webinars on a series of topics that might be important to me. I, I, I always wonder, what does a centipede eat? I could come and have a, as a webinar. Anybody ever see a centipede eat something? No. You just see a centipede running across your floor. But would that be of interest to people? Or does the people want to know, how can I be a better parent? How do I raise my child's self-esteem? How do both me and my child be better at communicating and bonding together? We need to make sure that your message is also what the audience will be interested in and willing to hear and it can give their life, a, a make a difference in their life. Any questions or comments? Very important. That attitude of communication, how you, how you come over, mm -hmm. how you express, 
how you how you understand your role is very important because the the, the <laughs> point about it is as soon as you get up to speak you become a leader for that moment for that moment for that time for that situation you are the leader and if you do not portray the attitude of a leader then you have failed your speech would be a flop and this is where feedback becomes important did i demonstrate when i gave my speech that i was leading mm -hmm. did i demonstrate confidence did i demonstrate that i understood what i was talking about because if you don't understand it you can expect the audience to understand if you're communicating you have to understand it first and then once you have understood it and internalized it then you can communicate it so the, there's a lot of psychology there's a lot of body language there's a lot that we need to understand in communicating and in communicating an element of that is leadership and we, we mentioned the case of our prime minister when she communicates she communicates leadership I, she she doesn't say but in a sense silently she says i'm in charge she says i'm in charge she doesn't say it, but you get it i like i love when like sometimes a reporter asks a silly question or something that she just said and she mm -hmm. just looks mm -hmm. and that is a form of communication like sometimes she, the person doesn't even bother to answer the question or yeah. <laughs> to change it she, all of these things are ways we can communicate and that's another thing i want us to touch on there are different ways of communicate. Some of us communicate verbally, others communicate with facial expressions. There are some people that like you might have that one friend that when your friend looks at this, but you was like, oh, I know she don't like this person. You, you communicate with your facial, your body. Some people use their hands. We have sign language. Mm -hmm. There are a number of ways to communicate. And also, no communication is communication. So if somebody asks you a question and you don't answer it or you avoid it, you are answering the question. <laughs> it just might not be the answer the person is looking for, but that is a form of communication. It is indeed. It is indeed. In fact, what we do not realize is that negative communication sometimes is not in your best interest because the, the, the communication that you communicate, the nonverbal communication that you communicate is not what you want to communicate but the person receives from you a negative impression of you because you have not communicated. Mm -hmm. I have gone to official meetings in which we have official delegates representing the countries and people come representing their countries and sit down in the meeting and say nothing. If you sit in a meeting and say nothing for a whole two to three hours, I mean, what do you expect me to think about you? on a topic on which you should have an opinion, but you say nothing, then I, I must think, well, this, this person is dumb. This person doesn't know. The person not qualified. I mean, what? what? And, and the point I'm making is what you communicate to me is not probably what you wish to communicate, but the message that I'm getting is that, you know, you are not with it. You're not up to the task. So it is better to communicate and say who you are and what you're there for, and what you stand for. Another, yeah. Oh, go ahead, ma'am. I was going to say also, if I look at it from, um, from a medical point of view, when you have a patient and you, you, you're sending that patient home with instruction as to how to take a medication or how to you know, perform something um, to do with their health, you tell them the, the patient would sit there and they're just looking. And for me, I don't, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. You're not giving me anything. So in, in the medical field, we have this, the, we have this method whereby I would tell you what you need to do and explain everything to you. And then I'll say, do you understand? And most of the time they'll say yes. And then I'll say, well, then tell no. me what you understand. Make the patient <laughs> eat what I just said, explain back to me, because that's our only way of knowing if you truly understand. So you're right with the points you're making. If you said nothing, we can take it anyhow. We don't know if you understand. And or it can look kind of silly to me because it's like, how could you not have something to say? This is um, another point that frustrates me. I, I'll be in a class. 
as a student and the teacher is speaking and teacher doing really good at explaining they have the visuals they have the written they do, they're really trying you know to get you to understand this topic and for some reason christine's brain does not understand so i am going to ask a hundred times and that teacher i i don't know if getting frustrated and if my teacher is watching she will understand and I, but when I do understand, I understand. And then the teacher would do the same thing that you did and tell me to explain it back. Okay, if the teacher realizes that she is not able to explain it in a way, she may ask, does anyone else in the class not understand? Or if they do understand, everybody, nobody is saying that they understand. So the teacher decides she's going to go around and ask each person to explain it so that I would get different versions of it to realize that nobody apparently understands. Why? Because nobody wants to be the one to say they don't know or well, they don't understand. Yes, because <laughs> we are we have this thing in our mind that we don't want to be the stupid one. Sometimes <laughs> you have to be the stupid one. And sometimes even if I realize like I'll be in the class and the person by my Chris asks a question and I'm like, you ask because you don't want to come across that you're the idiot. But you you sometimes you have to be. If you're an idiot or you just don't understand, you don't understand. There's nothing wrong with you not understanding. The other thing is we need to understand is a message. We have the message. I'm giving you a message. It is encoded. You have to decode it. I might intend it in one way, but when you receive it, you receive it in another way. For some reason, the, the message was lost in translation. That is okay. But then when you now communicate back to me, then I will know, oh no, she misunderstand what I say. Or yes, you definitely understand. We even have the, I, I speak to some teenagers and you and your best friend not speaking. And I'm like, but oh, okay, why well, you're not speaking to her? And then sometimes when you listen to the story is like some simple misunderstanding, especially when you're using text messages and WhatsApp. Sometimes you lose what you actually try to say. For me, if anybody typed to me in caps lock, I believe you're shouting at me. So automatically I already offended. Rather than if I just pick up the phone and I call you and I hear your voice, I hear your tone, or I see you in person, I realize, oh, you're being sarcastic with me is a joke. Then the message now has changed. So now you have to take in consideration. Now we have all of these technology, but sometimes when you are writing or texting to somebody, it might be, it might be interpreted in the way, not in the way that we intend for it to be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, misunderstandings occur very easily when people are using words in different ways that do not convey exactly what's intended. And people can become very, very offended. Um, I think that, that there are two things I would like to mention before we close. One is children must learn that there is no stupid question. Mm -hmm. There is no stupid question. If you have a question, if something you don't understand and you need to ask a question, ask it because there's no stupid question. It is better to ask the question than to go away without understanding what went on. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things we have to communicate to our children. The other thing I wanted to mention, which is a very powerful tool that we use in school when I was going to school, is something we used to call Precy. I don't know if they still do it in school. In school, when I was growing up, the teacher would ask you to read a story. Then you would close the book and she would say, tell me that story in your own words. Oh. So you read the story in the book as it's written by someone. And then you close the book, put the book away and say, tell me in 10 minutes, tell me, tell me that story. What, what did you learn from that story? What is the story about? That, that helps to create or helps to develop the creative mind because you are set now to take what somebody else has said and to put it in your own words and to communicate it back to the teacher. And the teacher can then help you to determine whether you got it right or you got it wrong. That is a very important tool of schooling that I don't know if they still do it in school today, if it is still. Christine, did you have that in school? Not really, but 
sometimes you would the teacher might give you an English literature um something to read and then come and ask your interpretation. But I see this come naturally with students, like ch young children. You might read them a story by the bedtime or so, and then the child is at play in their own time, and they take out the book, and I mean with confidence, you know, looking at these pictures and telling a whole story and. Like, if you listen, you'll be like, oh, wow, this is, um, is role playing for the child. But they are using, sometimes they mix, like, if you tell them you wrote, like, read, like, five different stories, they mix these five different stories into one story based <laughs> on what they're seeing in this book. I have no problem with that because that's composition skills. And so, but it's the way that they can express themselves. And she said this and this happened. And you look at this picture and I was like, oh, this happened to this bitch. <laughs> you don't like, I might not see it, but the child has it. I, I see something similar to that happening. But in school, I didn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure anybody else. Mm -hmm. It was part of our development in language and English composition, what we call praise. Precy meant, Precy <laughs> meant, meant making a summary. Basically, Precy meant making a summary of what you just read. Oh, we, we, we do the English, but we're just more summarizing what it is. Yeah. 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 I know you have to go, Dr. Chelston. Yes. I, Thank you very I, I, much I, I, for being a part of the program. I do have a video still like to share with the others. So if they're still interested, you could, I could. Play the video and Dr. Chelsea. Yes, I still have a few video. minutes to stay for the video. Okay. I'm going to share the video now. Just get up on that podium. All right, I'm here. That was easy. Now I just need to. Oh my gosh! How many people are in the audience? A hundred? A thousand? Don't count. Okay, I can do this. I'm gonna focus on my notes. What did I have written down again? Uh, hello. My... <laughs> okay, if this sounds like your worst nightmare, you're not alone. Actually, you're one of the estimated 70% of the population that has an intense fear of public speaking. And that's okay, because on today's Wellcast, we've got our triple P method that will get you through and get you calm during that next oral report and keep your breakfast where it belongs. You ready? Many polls list public speaking as the most commonly reported phobia among Americans. It's called glassophobia, meaning literally, fear of the tongue. A study by Texas Christian University tested 48 women and 48 men enrolled in a public speaking class and found that those who exhibited high trait anxiety had the most physical symptoms of distress when speaking publicly. So what if you're the kind of person whom any bit of social acrobatics is tantamount to entering a lion's den. Hey, calm down. Okay, I'm just kidding, but seriously, calm down, all right? We've got our triple P method that'll get you through that next public speaking gig. Pause and print this Wellcast worksheet. Step one, prepare, prepare, prepare. We said it three times because it's that important. There are two things that go into being prepared. Number one, knowing your subject backwards and forwards. Two, knowing exactly how you're going to present it step by step. In your Wellcast worksheet, write down the major points that you want to get across to the audience. Get the ideas out of your head and onto the paper. Okay. In the next column to the right, start ordering these points in a logical manner. Arguing <coughs> your point to the audience and winning them over is like a boxing match. First, start with some fancy footwork, a fact or an anecdote that will hook the audience in and get them to pay attention to you. Then, throw a couple of swings, supporting evidence for your argument, stats, personal stories, something that will start to convince the audience that you're taking control, and finally, the knockout, a landing blow of statements that's memorable, convincing, and sums up your speech's position. All right, step two, posture and physicality are key. Part of keeping your anxiety at bay while giving your speech is knowing what to do with your body. Before your speech, avoid large meals or dairy products, which will make you feel like you need to clear your throat incessantly. Bring a bottle of water on stage if you're allowed. Don't be afraid to take sips throughout your speech. It'll keep your voice natural, and it gives you a moment to pause and regain your composure if needed. Stand naturally, not too stiff or slumped. 
Good posture will help you breathe and speak easier, and it'll let your audience know that you're calm and in control. Step three, panda to your audience. The best public speakers know how to work the room. Don't be completely serious unless the occasion calls for it. Don't read entirely off the cards. Keep a natural cadence and pace. Throw a joke or a side in, it'll draw in a laugh. If there's a silence, then turn that into a joke. Stay natural, self-effacing, and the audience will be on your side. Let's recap. You'd rather face a poisonous reptile than public speak, huh? Well, follow the well-cast triple P checklist. Prepare extensively for your speech. Know your content backwards and forwards and figure out the absolute best way to present it and to win over your audience. Watch your posture and physicality. This includes everything from standing naturally to breathing from your diaphragm. And pander to your audience. Keep them in the palm of your hand and with an easy demeanor, natural cadence, and of course, jokes. <laughs> Tweet us at Thank you. So that was just to summarize what we would have discussed throughout this webinar in terms of it's important to prepare. Prepare. We discuss our verbal and nonverbal cues, body language, facial expressions, and not to be too serious. So yes, if it's a serious matter, yes, but it's okay to, to make jokes. Be comfortable know what you're speaking about research have your i do not read off word for word many people do that in speeches and it loses the audience so try to be able to and make eye contact sometimes you have that one family member or somebody in the audience that you when you look at them they make you smile or they just feel like you're warm and encouraging you can look around the room these are very important parts points in terms of how to speak in public. Another major point that we would have discussed was the importance of being able to express yourself. And this can start in the home. It starts with you, parents, that it shall be able to, according to Dr. Chelson, was that word again? Pan, pan was the word that you did in school? Meaning Percy. to make a summary, Percy. Use Percy so that you read each other's story, but let them tell you what they think happened like in their own words. Thank you very much for joining, joining us in our webinar number three. Feel free to drop Chrissy's care a 